Some really big key points to think about when reviewing a semi-hermetic reciprocating. They're built to be serviced. If it's semi-hermetic to begin with, it's made to be serviced. And so get your head around that, especially if you're used to light commercial and residential things of that nature and you're coming into the heavy side and getting into chillers and such. And a lot of stuff gets fixed. You know, there's lots of times where we're not there to necessarily just change parts. We're there to see how we can go about fixing that system. And having semi-hermetic compressors just is exactly that. You know, centrifugals, screws, reciprocating, all of these are semi-hermetics for us. All of these are meant to be serviced in some way. Even some of the more advanced screws, while we don't open those up as much in the field, uh, there's still a lot of little things that can be done and procedures you can go through in the field without having to change the whole compressor out or trash it or anything along those lines and they the reciprocating they are just their car motor if you have any automotive foundation or anything at all in your background this is an amazing compressor to work with and get get comfortable and familiar with opening compressors up and working on and to be honest, while semi-hermetic reciprocating, there's still plenty of them out there. If you could find just an old trashed one, maybe call up some local uh, compressor vendors. Uh, CSG. So CSG supplied uh, quite a few of the photos I've gotten to use inside of this particular module. And, uh, the, you know, somebody like them, talk to them and see if they've got an old body or something. Or maybe they'll let you come in and do some teardowns on some old bodies they have in their shop and get some hands on with getting to open these compressors up. If you've not gotten to do this kind of stuff before, it is really important to start trying to apply the hands on as much as you can. And if you could take the breakdown course and open one of these up, start laying parts out, maybe take the manual from this uh, lesson or from this modules, the, the, the compressor manuals I had in there, along with the module itself and Put some hands on to it. Uh, you might have a hard time finding a screw compressor body that somebody will let you tear into, especially because those are those cores, especially, are really valuable. Um, the reciprocating are less so. They're, they're not trash, and the industry is not done with those compressors. But uh, it, in my opinion, you'll have a lot easier time getting somebody to say, oh, okay, yeah, well, I got this one, it's locked up, this burnout, whatever happened. You can go do a teardown on it and do an inspection and see what happened. That, I mean, it's actually, this is quite literally one of the things I did whenever they got me introduced. Um, I had an opportunity early on, when I, this was when I was first getting into industrial and first getting into chillers. Uh, somebody had three... They were, and they were Copelands. They weren't even Carlisle's. Three uh, Copelands that were different styles that sitting around that were just trash. They weren't good for anything. They weren't in, in operation. And they allowed me to take a few days. And I, on my personal time, I went back over there and, and to their warehouse. And I stripped them down. And I took pictures and inspected and looked at all kinds of... I didn't have anybody there to walk me through it, guide me, talk to, talk to me about it. I didn't take their time for that. I was able to get my hands on what was there, the valve plates, and get my mind around how all this went together, what made it work, and what it looked like on the inside. And so when I, when later that scaled into much larger, much more in-depth systems, I already had this heavy comfort with it. You know, more than just I grew up working on motors for cars and trucks. I've actually been inside of these semi-hermetics before, even if, even when I, so the Carlisle's were the ones I spent the most time on in the field. Getting into those, like, because I had that, that early entry level, that's my point, it made a really, really big difference and helped increase my comfort level to a point where it wasn't a big deal for me to have to dive into it. That's my main point, because it's a, when you've never done it and you've got to get into this and figure it out on a customer's machine and you don't have that pre hands-on comfort level and there's nobody there to guide you through this, like it can be, it's really daunting and, and the, the risk of a mistake is much higher versus if you have one that's already trash anyway. It doesn't matter if you break something in the process. 
And it doesn't have to go back together perfectly either. Like, nobody cares. So make some mistakes on that one. Figure out how it comes apart on that one. Even if you can't get it back together, so be it. And then when you get to the customers, you don't have to learn those things with theirs. You don't have to make mistakes with theirs and use theirs as your guinea pig to then feel comfortable doing this in the future. One of the things to understand though is, so screw compressors completely replaced reciprocating mostly due to just efficiency. Uh, as systems became more efficient, reciprocating designs cannot compete at a screws level. And screws are just far better at what they do than a reciprocating. And they're just as reliable. And uh, that was one of the big things that was in contention in the early days. Were screws going to be reliable enough to be trusted and counted on in a, it, it compared to what a reciprocating could do? And it turns out they could with some tweaks along the way. You know, the manufacturers had a lot to learn. It was a new technology at the time, but it slammed the market and kept going. And some of the early screw machines that came out, like the RTAAs by train, holy cow, were they fantastic. Anyway, sorry, this is... We'll talk about screws in the next module, but that's what it came down to. Not that this was a failed or, or ineffective technology. It's incredible. It's great. Reciprocatings are amazing, uh, but they couldn't compete for efficiency at the volumes and scales that we are operating at. And what was also great about reciprocating, they had such a simple staging process. Like the suction cutoff staging with just a basic unloader, especially when it went to an electronic it's just so simple and so easy to work on, so easy to service. There's the whole platform, whether Copeland or Carlisle. It's just, it's simple. And that's, what I, that's one of the things I loved and appreciated about it. It wasn't complicated. Now, it could be a bit of a pain to try to tune a mechanical unloader, especially on a multi-compressor circuit. That was a little challenging. But when it worked, it just, it worked so well. So uh, it's a very simple staging process that preluded, you know, scrolls, internal unloading and two stage capacity and all that. I mean, in my opinion, what, what we learned how to do with reciprocating preceded that, you know, now s screws don't do that at all. They've got slide valves internally and a completely different set of mechanisms that allow them to load and unload. But for scrolls, to me, some of the technology that makes you know a two-stage scroll or a digital scroll today what it is was born. Like the concept was born with what we were doing in a reciprocating, but they found ways of integrating that same design theory into a scroll body. That's just my opinion and in, in looking at it from a historical perspective, which I'm big on. And what was great about it is, even though it had a robust, uh, for its time at least, oil management system and process, and it was simple. It was really simple. Now granted, you, DX evaporators are not near as efficient as flooded. And these compressors just didn't get implemented on flooded designs. At least not any of them that I, I saw or I'm aware of that exist. They just, that's not where they serve their best. So uh, because of that, what made oil management for these complicated was equalizing. Like I spent more issues trying to work out oil equalization between the circuits than I did anything else. That was something that, you know, it just, that's what gave me the biggest fits was trying to get the oil to equalize. And sometimes those tubes, especially after like a burnout and a sludge and if you don't flush that tube out, I've had stuff get in there and, and, pl and plug it up. And uh, then it wouldn't equalize at all if you're using the small tubes. Not not the big ones, but the, the small under uh, uh, coming from under the motor or the, the, for the, where the stator is. Let me get my words out. Anyway, highly repairable. Very simple designs for what they are. Like There's, act there's not really that much happening in there. Uh, and, but it's, it's one of those that for most people, most of us that do this, it's fairly easy to understand the concepts whereas some of these others get way more in the weeds on the physics being used and how we're using it while we're using it and such my overall kind of closing thoughts on what matters with a reciprocating compressor